So hello, everybody. Um, let's see if everybody's ready. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Natia Ingram. I am the management analyst for Denver's Office of Marijuana Policy. Um, I have with me here today a number of experts in various aspects of um, legalization, legalization impact analysis. Catherine DeYoung at the far end um, is an epidemiologist who works for Denver Public Health. She reports back to the city of Denver on public health impact data. Um, Steve Fialia is a senior research analyst for the state of Oregon, and he similarly does public health impact data, but for Oregon. And Adam Orens is a founding member of the Marijuana Policy Group, and his team, among other things, has done some really great economic impact analysis um, around legalization in Colorado. So today, we're going to go over a number of topics, starting with just a general overview of the national landscape of legalization right now and the trends that we're seeing. We're gonna talk about public health data from Colorado and Oregon. And then Adam will give us a little overview of the Colorado economic impact. And then I'll take it back over to talk about impacts with crime, the environment, um, the operational impacts to the city of Denver. And if we have time, we're gonna wrap it up with a little overview of the dashboard technology that Denver is using to manage its operations. So, oh, and we'll have plenty of time at the end for questions, and also the presentation will be posted online later, um, so you will be able to get any of these slides you need. So to hop right in today, four states in the District of Columbia have legalized recreational marijuana. 26 states in the District of Columbia have medical marijuana programs. 16 states allow for the use of medical CBD oils. And 20 states have decriminalized the drug. So the picture we're really looking at is there are six states without any form of legalization or decriminalization law in their books. And that's gonna be the Dakotas, Kansas, Indiana, Arkansas, and West Virginia. Two of those six states are voting on legalization of a medical program this year. Altogether, there are six states, I mean eight states, voting on legalization measures this year. Now, this rapid expansion of legalization we're seeing is a direct result of shifting public opinion. So legalization supporters have been gaining in the polls over the last two decades. In the last five years, they've taken the majority. Although my graph here ends in 2014, at which point 54% of Americans supported full-blown recreational legalization, a 2015 poll conducted by Gallup put support at 58%, and an AP NORC Center for Public Affairs research poll completed in March of this year pegged support at 61%. Um, so to put that in perspective, more people would prefer recreational marijuana than either of our presidential candidates. Okay. Um, now this trend is being catapulted by the millennial generation, which is this black line you see here, coming of voting age and clearly having a strong opinion supporting legalization. But the trend is also prevalent in Generation X and the baby boomers. And so what does this mean? It means that legalization is a more prevalent question today than ever before, and it is more critical than ever that governments and voters have um, really good data on what the impacts of legalization are so that they can make educated voting and lawmaking decisions. And so today, hopefully, we're gonna share with you some of the data that we're seeing um, so that you can go out and spread the word. But then I'm gonna pass it off to Catherine, um, who's gonna talk about public health impact data in the state of Colorado. Thank you. Now, as Natia mentioned, I am uh, the epidemiologist for Denver Public Health, so I am working on uh, marijuana epidemiology at the city and county level. But today I'll be presenting specifically about marijuana health effects at the Colorado level. So as such, I need to uh, pay my respects to Caitlin Hall and other colleagues at the state Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment who provided um, the, the reports and presentations that I'll be sharing today. So as such, if you're interested, there are a number of very good, very informative and thorough reports that are available online. And you can find them by searching Monitoring Marijuana Colorado. There's this report on health effects. There's another report on uh, uh, health behaviors, so 
people using marijuana or having opinions about marijuana. Uh, so, to you know, you've heard of about our you know our timeline in Colorado, of course, but a very brief summary of of the way that things have gone in Colorado is that in 2001, medical marijuana became legalized, but at that time it was sort of a private arrangement of uh, you could get a, a green a, a medical marijuana license, um, and sort of the way that you got your marijuana was more or less up to you. Um, in 2010, medical marijuana became commercially available, so that is to say that it could be bought in stores. And then in 2014 is when retail or recreational marijuana became commercially available, also in stores for people over 21. So looking at, uh, first we're going to start by looking at youth perceptions and behaviors as we've seen in our local form of the Youth Behavioral Risk Survey, or the YRBS, which here is called the Healthy Kids Colorado Survey, or HKCS. So looking at student perceptions about the risk of harm, it's important for us to be able to compare this to other substances. So when we look at, uh, so this survey is done every other year, which conveniently for us happened in the year before and the year after medic, uh, retail marijuana became commercially available. So this is a good timing for us. So we have seen that there was indeed a significant decrease in the perception that mar regular marijuana use is moderately or greatly harmful. Uh, this is in comparison to the perception of risk associated with alcohol, which is held steady at a higher rate, and the perception of risk associated with daily use of cigarettes, which is also held steady. And we can see this as, a, in fact, a success story um, that uh, there has been considerable effort associated with um, driving home to adolescents the risks of using alcohol and the risks of using tobacco. And this is something that shows us that there's promise and there's progress to be made. Uh, we can have an effect, but it also means that we need to do something because the perception of harm is, is indeed going down related to marijuana. Looking at the prevalence of ever use and current use, where current use is, is described as using in the past 30 days, so you might also call it recent use. Um, we see that in Colorado, uh, in 2015, 38.6% of high school students reported ever using marijuana, and 21.7% reported currently or recently using marijuana. Also in uh, Colorado, ever and current use decreased slightly but not significantly since 2009. Um, one other thing to understand is that the survey methods in this particular survey have not been super consistent over time, so it is a little difficult to make exact comparisons, uh, but these are roughly the trends. Um, we also saw that there were no significant changes in, uh, in either ever use and current use so from 2011 to 2013 to 2015, you do see a slight, what's been described as a wobble or a wiggle in the data, but it's not significant. Um, and then also, we also see in this uh, graph that the 2015, in 2015, um, the points, the United States and Colorado have actually converged and are not significantly different from each other. It's also important for us to compare current marijuana use to other substances. So interestingly, students reported a high risk of perception of harm uh, associated with alcohol, but they also report using alcohol at higher rates than marijuana. So this is an interesting point for us and also a point to consider in prevention activities that uh, people understanding that a, a substance is harmful, shockingly, doesn't always mean that they don't use it. Uh, so this is something for us to understand in our prevention activities. Um, Another interesting point is that the prevalence of alcohol and tobacco use have declined significantly over time, um, whereas marijuana has held fairly stable. Looking at differences uh, in current use among Colorado high school students between 2013 and 2015, we see a similar trend, which is to say that between ninth and 10th grade seems to be the point at which people go from uh, not currently using marijuana to currently using marijuana. Uh, so this is an important thing for us in tailoring um, specific prevention messages to people before 
um, you know, perhaps more of their peers are using marijuana too after. We can speak to these students differently. Uh, there's also, of course, an interest in how people are using marijuana, and uh, we can say that among Colorado high school students, the majority are using it by smoking it, but an important number of students are also eating it in the form of edibles, vaping it, and using it in other ways, such as dabbing. Uh, an important concern for us, not just in terms of people trying marijuana, and then maybe perhaps deciding it's not for them. And people using it currently, that's an important thing for us to be able to speak to students about not doing that. Another very risky behavior is using, mar using marijuana and then driving. Um, so among Colorado high school students who had driven in the past 30 days, uh, we found that the, the percent held relatively stable. Between 10 and 11% of students who drove in the past 30 days had done so after using marijuana. Uh, so this is a stable number, but it is a not good number. Uh, one thing to note with this measure is that in this question, the length of time between marijuana use and driving was not specified. This is both an advantage and a disadvantage. So one piece of this issue where we didn't say, did you drive within four hours after using marijuana? One, this doesn't imply to these students that there is a defined safe amount of time after using marijuana to drive because we know that that is extremely variable in terms of whether they've used before, whether they're doing so on an empty stomach, whether they're smoking it or eating it. Um, the effects, the duration of effects are extremely variable. So it doesn't imply to them that there's a safe period of time, but it also means that we may be capturing people who specifically identified their behavior as risky, as yes, I did use marijuana and then drive in a period of time that I would say that these two events happened together. So looking again also at adult perceptions and behaviors, we see that among Colorado adults, me meaning people who are 18 years of age or older, 54% uh, of Colorado adults believe that daily or near daily use of marijuana has a moderate or great risk of harm. So in 2014, and this information comes to us from, uh, on this slide from uh, NISDA and from Burfus. Um, we saw that close to 50% of Colorado adults had ever used marijuana, and close to 14% had used marijuana currently in the past 30 days. And among current users, 33% of users reported using marijuana near and daily. Now, over time, and again, this is something where we don't, part of the problem is, is having consistent access to the same data. But uh, over time, when we compare these two surveys, we see that there are the estimates of current use among Colorado adults have increased slightly. Um, so in the NISDA data, it went from 11% in 2010 and 2011, down slightly, and up to 13% in 2013, and then close to 14% in 2014. Looking a little bit more closely at current marijuana users, we see that uh, current use is higher among men, young adults, people with lower educational attainment and household income, and also gay, lesbian, or bisexual adults. Most current users smoke it, and this question, unlike the, um, the youth question, this is uh, people could choose more than one. As you can see, these add up to more than 100%. So most people who use smoke it, but a significant percent also eat it in the form of edibles, uh, vaporize it and dab it, and then a smaller percent use it in some other way, such as perhaps topical applications or by drinking it. Importantly, um, among current users, 18.8% uh, reported driving after using marijuana. So this is, again, an important prevention messaging opportunity for us to be able to say this is not a safe activity. So looking at health effects, we have data from our local poison center, the Rocky Mountain Poison Center. We also have emergency department visits and hospitalizations from our Colorado Hospital Association data source. Looking at the poison center, these are calls to the poison center in which the person calling reported that the substance exposure was marijuana. They can report one substance or multiple substances, as you can see in this graph. We did see a significant increase after medical marijuana stores became commercially 
open, and also when, mar when marijuana became commercially available for retail use. We also saw that um, most of this increase is accounted for by marijuana alone. So in the blue here, you see these are marijuana exposures alone, and the green shows us uh, marijuana and other substances. So we may uh, hypothesize that these marijuana alone exposures may be in part driven by edibles, um, but that's something that we need to look into further. Of course, we're very interested in uh, age effects, especially on exposures among pediatrics, ex accidental exposures in which children get into something, and also among adolescents and, and children who are experimenting with marijuana. These are concerns for us. So we do see that after medical marijuana became commercially available, the calls among people who were zero up to 17 years old and among people who are 25 years and older increased significantly. So that's again, that's after medical marijuana became commercially available. After recreational marijuana became available in stores, calls in all age groups increased significantly. So now let's look at emergency department visits and hospitalizations. Um, so this is just to orient you a little bit to this information. Uh, we look at this as rates per 100,000 total visits. And this allows us to compare separate uh, and you know, different groups of time. Uh, so for instance, we're able to compare 2010 to 2013, which is several years of data, and 2014 to Ju June 2015, because we're doing this out of the total visits in that time period. So we are able to smooth for different time sizes. Um, we're also, in most of these slides, defining marijuana-related or potentially marijuana-related visits as ones where uh, there was a marijuana diagnosis code in the first three priority codes. Now this is something that we don't get to know exactly that marijuana caused a visit to the emergency department or a hospitalization, but we know that it was ranked higher as, the, as a, a relevant code than if it was someplace else in the, in the codes. So having said that, you can see in these little asterisks that were, there were significant increases in uh, um, hospitalizations after the medical marijuana commercialization period and after the retail marijuana uh, commercialization period. There was also a significant increase in emergency department visits after retail marijuana became commercially available. Unfortunately, our, re our emergency department visits only go back to the year 2011, so we're not able to compare further back. Looking at uh, marijuana compared to other substances, we do still see that alcohol is far and away the most significant out of these three, those, these four concerns in terms of causing um, emergency department visits. This shouldn't be a surprise to any of us. Um, we do see further down that marijuana is uh, an, a more uh, prevalent concern in terms of emergency department visits than stimulants and opioids. Uh, we do interestingly see that there was a peak in 2014, but that it actually decreased in 2015. Looking at age, the age breakdown of this, and this is something where we actually, this looks at uh, any mention of any diagnosis of marijuana, not just at the first three priority diagnosis codes. Um, but we do see that um, in, uh, there have been significant increases in so, several of our age groups, in fact, all of our age groups over time, especially between the medical marijuana and retail marijuana legalization periods. We see that there was a significant increase in the pediatric exposures when medical marijuana became commercially available. That's the little nine there, um, but not when retail marijuana became commercially available. And again, also these are very small numbers and very small rates. Uh, so it's important to understand that this is a significant concern for us in being able to prevent these exposures, but also that this is, in terms of hospitalizations and emergency department visits, a relatively rare occurrence. So in conclusion, the things that we are especially concerned about are the youth perceptions of risk in terms of being able to say, yes, this is not something that, that youth should be using. <coughs> also in their their uh, preventing students from beginning to, to re regularly use marijuana, and also especially both among youth and among adults, and being able to communicate to adults and, and youth that driving after using marijuana is not safe, 
and especially when we look at the combinations of marijuana and alcohol as a, uh, as a risk factor, this is a really extremely risky behavior. Um, and then also in terms of health effects, it's important for us to continue to have a focus on pediatric accidental exposures and on adolescents who begin to experiment with this. Thanks. Good job. Can I put it in here? Does that work? Can you hear me? Okay, so as Natia said, my name is Stephen Fiala, and I'm a senior research analyst for the Oregon Public Health Division, and I focus primarily on marijuana surveillance, and then also my coworker, Julia Dilley, over here. Um, is our principal investigator for an NIH-funded grant looking at local marijuana policy in both Oregon and Washington. So um, I'm going to focus on Oregon data today, though. Uh, so before we dive into the data, I want to provide a couple Oregon marijuana milestones to give you a bit of context. So in 1998, Measure 67 established our Oregon Medical Marijuana Act, and that allowed the uh, cultivation, possession, and use of marijuana as recommended by a doctor. In 2013, we had House Bill 3460, which allowed the establishment of medical marijuana dispensaries and also established a medical marijuana patient registry. And, and this uh, establishment of dispensaries becomes important as we talk about uh, the implementation of retail, which we'll get to in a second. In 2014, we had Ballot Measure 91 uh, that legalized marijuana for recreational use. In August of 2015, so just last year, we had Senate Bill 460 that allowed the early sale of retail, retail marijuana through our existing medical marijuana dispensaries. So that's why that 2013 bill was important because at the time that this was passed, um, well, maybe not at the time, but I looked this morning at the medical marijuana program's uh, licensed dispensaries, and there are 401. Uh, so as you consider the rollout of a retail market that first takes place in dispensaries, we already had 401 of them in the community. And another side note, I won't take too long though, um, the Oregon Medical Marijuana Program administered a survey to those dispensaries asking them if they were going to stay medical marijuana dispensaries or if they were going to transition into retail stores by applying for a license through the Oregon Liquor Control Commission and 90% of them said that yes, they uh, will transition to retail stores which would leave about 40 medical marijuana dispensaries in the state. Okay, in June of 2016, we had, uh, oh, sorry, in October 1st of 2015 is when we had those limited retail sales through dispensaries, um, and that was only flour. So you couldn't get edibles, you couldn't get concentrates or extracts, just the flour at that point. So then from October 2015 to June 2016, uh, they then expanded those early retail sales to include edibles uh, and some extracts. October 2016, so right now, uh, October 1st, the Oregon Liquor Control Commission began licensing retail stores. So, and then December 31st, so by the end of this year, again, those medical marijuana dispensaries need to decide if they want to continue uh, selling medical marijuana or if they want to apply to the Oregon Liquor Control Commission to transition to be a retail store. Okay, and a lot of the data that we're going to look at today uh, are in this marijuana report that was produced and released at the beginning of this year by the Oregon Public Health Division. Um, and then we're also currently working on an update to this report that's going to be out in December-ish. Ish. Um, so you can either get to this by navigating through the Oregon Public Health Division website or do what I do, which is just Google Oregon Marijuana Report. That's easier. And then quickly, some of our data sources, we're gonna be looking at youth data that come from our Oregon Healthy Teen Survey, which is administered in odd years, and our Student Wellness Survey administered in even years. And this is Oregon's equivalent of the Youth Risk Behavior Survey that's conducted nationally. For our adult data, we're gonna be using the Oregon Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System data that I'm sure others are familiar with. And then we also have some data from an online survey of adults that we administered in fall of 2015, spring of 2016, and then we have this online survey in the field right now. And each wave of that survey had 2,000 adults. 
We're also going to look at marijuana related calls to the Oregon Poison Center, which are captured through their toxic exposure surveillance system. We're going to look at emergency department visits captured through the Oregon Electronic Surveillance System for the Early Notification of Community Based Epidemics, or ESSENCE. So Catherine referred to that, we'll call it ESSENCE. Uh, we're going to look at hospital discharge data through our Oregon Hospital Discharge Database. And then lastly, we'll look at some arrest data over time that come from the Oregon State Police. Okay, uh, we're going to talk about perceptions and behaviors first, focusing on youth. And so the first graph that we're going to look at here is youth's perceived harm of weekly marijuana use. Uh, and in Oregon, our survey is administered to eighth graders and 11th graders separately. So for all our youth data, we're going to have eighth graders in orange, 11th graders in blue, so we can compare. Uh, and we see that from 2010 to 2016, that perceived harm of weekly marijuana use has decreased over time for both eighth graders and 11th graders. Uh, currently, 59% of eighth graders think weekly marijuana use is harmful, and 40% of 11th graders think weekly marijuana use is harmful. Um, and then I have this gray vertical line here to show the transition from 2014 to 2016, and that time period is when we had those early retail sales start in the dispensaries. Um, and so there's actually a very gradual decline from the 2014 to 2016. And of course, we'll keep measuring that. Uh, and overall, 11th graders perceive mer weekly marijuana use as less harmful than 8th graders. Okay, and to put weekly marijuana use and perceived harm in the context of the other products that Catherine mentioned, including prescription drugs not prescribed to them, smoking a pack or more of cigarettes a day, binge drinking, and then drinking one to two alcohol drinks per day, uh, we found that eighth graders think marijuana use is less harmful than using cigarettes daily, binge drinking, and using prescription drugs prescribed to them, while 11th graders think marijuana use is the least harmful of all these substances. And Catherine did a nice job of pointing out that we have had a long history of targeting things like tobacco use and, and alcohol use through prevention programs, so that's good to see that the perceived harm for those products is high. Okay, next we're gonna look at a graph um, on perceived ease of access to the product uh, for both eighth and 11th graders over time. Uh, and we see that perceived easy access to marijuana has remained relatively unchanged over time for both 11th graders and eighth graders. Uh, and that line uh, denoting the early retail sales uh, did not really have that much of an impact. There's a slight increase from 2014 to 2016. Uh, but overall, this perceived ease of access for marijuana has stayed the same. And again, to put marijuana in the context of other products, uh, here we have it next to beer, wine, or hard liquor. Um, if they think it's easy to get prescription drugs, if they think it's easy to get cigarettes. Uh, and we see that eighth graders perceive marijuana as easier to get than prescription prescription drugs and cigarettes, while 11th graders perceive marijuana as easiest to access um, of all of these substances. Okay, uh, now we're gonna go into youth use, and so this is showing current marijuana use defined as any use in the past 30 days over time, and we have 11th graders on the top, both Oregon and nationally, and 8th graders on the bottom, both Oregon and nationally, and we have seen that marijuana use has actually remained fairly stable over time, both in Oregon and nationally. Um, and youth marijuana use in Oregon has historically been a bit higher than nationally, but also as Catherine mentioned, especially with the eighth graders, we see this kind of convergence uh, between Oregon and national use for youth. Okay. Uh, we also asked both 8th and 11th graders what their usual method of marijuana use, uh, and we asked this among current users. And, and similar to Colorado, they can only pick one, so it's their, their kind of like top choice, I guess. Uh, and we see that the vast majority reported smoking the product, so similar to Colorado. Uh, and then fewer ate it, vaporized it, dabbed it, used it in some other way, and then very few uh, were drinking like uh, infusion of it. Um, we changed this question to be similar to our adult question where they could pick any uh, type of product that they used in the past 30 days and we'll see how uh, the adult uh, preference differs when they're allowed to pick multiple choices. Uh, but in this case, vast majority smoked it. Okay, and we also ask on our survey among current users about driving. Uh, we in Oregon chose to include the kind of time frame of three hours after use. 
um, pros and cons to each way of asking it. And we found that for 11th graders, 6% of current users reported driving within three hours of using marijuana. And 21% of adult uh, current users reported driving within three hours. And if you actually split the adults out by frequent and less frequent users, 36% uh, of frequent users using 20 or more days in the past 30 reported driving within three hours versus 7% of less frequent users. So the frequency of use has an effect on that. Okay, now we're gonna get into adults specifically. And first, this is hard to read, so. You don't have to try, I'll read it for you. Uh, so here are some marijuana attitudes among adults. We don't ask the perceived harm question on the Burfus uh, that Catherine reported on. So this is from that online survey. And it's very small, but on the far left in the blue, uh, we have that 55% of adults thought that marijuana legalization would lead to more underage use. 9% uh, said that they thought their own use of marijuana would increase after legalization. Moving on to the middle three bars, 74% uh, thought that marijuana use during pregnancy would affect the outcome of the baby. 75% um, reported that they thought driving under the influence of marijuana would increase the chance for a crash. 54% did believe that those who start uh, marijuana use early face greater long-term health and addiction risks, which is one of the messages that came out of this uh, scientific advisory committee and thinking through which uh, public health division messages were okay with putting forth, so that's why it was tested. And then those last three columns on the right, 75% said they would be bothered if people used marijuana in front of children. 56% uh, said that they would be bothered if people use marijuana in public, which we heard a lot about today. And 45% said they'd be bothered if there was a store that sold marijuana in their neighborhood or community. Okay, now getting into some use. So this is also from the NISDA, the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, because uh, Oregon added marijuana use to its adult BRFA survey in 2014, so we don't have these overtime data, but luckily we have this national survey. And so on top we have Oregon and national uh, young adults, 18 to 25, and on the bottom we have Oregon and national older adults, so 26 years uh, older, older, apologize. Are we all older adults here? <laughs> Um, so we have seen that over time, Oregon's marijuana use among adults has been consistently higher than national use, um, and there has been this slight increase over time, and that clearly uh, use among young adults is higher than use among older adults. Okay, now looking at Oregon-specific data, so again, we added it to our survey in 2014, so we have 2014 and 2015 here, which is nice. 2014 is pre-early market opening, 2015 is during the period of early retail sales through the medical marijuana dispensaries. Uh, and we see that ever and current use among Oregon adults has not drastically changed from 2014 to 2015. Uh, and that we had 51% of adults report ever using marijuana in their life. Uh, and then we currently, well, as of 2015, 12% of adults reported current use, so use in the past 30 days. Okay, next, so this is kind of busy, but it's kind of interesting too. So the next one is frequency of use among current users. So we have the one day user, on, oh wow, okay. I need to speed it up. Uh, so we have the one day user on the far left and all 30 days on the right. And what I wanted to point out here is that from 2014 to 2015, uh, we saw a decrease in this less uh, frequent use of around two to three days and saw these increases among the more frequent users, uh, 20 to 29 days in all 30 days. And then also splitting current marijuana use uh, by age group from 2014 to 2015 actually saw slight decreases in that young adult age group of 18 to 24, 25, and increases uh, among that group 25 to 44, and then 45 to 64. So some interesting trends. Uh, and then for methods of marijuana use among adult current users, uh, we do see again that the majority of adults report smoking it. 
Um, but you can also see here that when they're allowed to pick whatever form they used in the past 30 days, that we have higher proportions, eating it, drinking it, vaping it. Uh, and then looking at 2014 to 2015, we do see increases uh, in these other types of use, like eating it going from 26 to 35, drinking, vaping. And we also saw this increase on the far end of multiple forms. So reporting a combination of any of these in the past 30 days also increased. Okay, now we're gonna look at some environment data. So on that panel survey, we asked um, adults if in the past month they had seen or heard marijuana advertising in their communities. And then we also asked if they had seen or heard any marijuana health risk messages in their communities. And we found that 55% of adults in Oregon reported seeing or hearing an advertisement for marijuana in their community. And 29% uh, reported hearing or seeing a health risk message. Um, at the time this was asked, we didn't have our youth prevention campaign program in the field, uh, which has uh, billboards and social media ads, et cetera, so it'll be interesting to track exposure to health risk me messages over time now that that is in the environment. For those adults that reported seeing or hearing advertising in their community, we then asked what types of advertising they saw, and they could select whatever type they saw in the past month. So this is organized uh, by highest proportion to lowest, and we see that 75% of those who were exposed reported seeing advertising at a storefront. 67% uh, reported street side marketing, 56% reported billboards, down, down, down. And I highlighted billboards because I was informed that Colorado recently uh, uh, banned or pr now prohibits the use of billboards for marijuana advertising, so that's very interesting, great. Um, and this is similar to the tobacco industry, you know, they're not allowed to advertise on billboards either. And just for some local examples of what that could look like, here's a storefront in Oregon of what advertising could look like. So they have a banner ad, a sandwich board style ad in front of their store. This mannequin was actually motorized and was rotating the sign. It's very distracting, um, compelling. Um, so that's a storefront. Here's an example of street side marketing. So it's a banner ad attached to a fence and also features an adorable owl that I think could appeal to a child. Uh, here's an example of a billboard, and I think this one's particularly interesting because it kind of co-opted that Got Milk slogan, and it also features dabs or dabbing, which is kind of a lesser known form of marijuana use, so I thought that was interesting that that was in the environment. Um, here's an example of advertising in a newspaper, and this was the kiosk to get the newspaper for a, a local newspaper, and they were advertising their feature story, which was perfect pairings of Girl Scout cookies and cannabis strains. It was very fascinating. Um, and then here's a couple pictures of uh, folks on the street waving signs. The guy on the left advertising $10 a gram, and the guy on the right pointing the way to a dispensary. And lastly, uh, we're gonna review some, quickly, quickly review in a minute, some public health outcomes. And so first we have quarterly marijuana-related calls to the Oregon Poison Center. This is from 2013 to 2015. Um, and over time, we have seen increases since 2013. There are 158 calls total in 2015, and right now through quarter three of 2016, we've seen 281, so an increase in call volume. It is interesting to note at the very end here um, how it has that slight dip, and that could be a data wobble, which I really like and I'm gonna use now. Um, or uh, people could just be getting bored with it. I'm not quite sure. But it's interesting that it falls right in alignment with June 2016, was, which was when that early sales expanded to include edibles. So we were really interesting, interested to see how that expansion would affect um, all of these public health outcomes, and we actually saw a dip. So now we need quarter four to see what happens. And when we separate marijuana-related calls to the Poison Center by age, uh, we see that there have been increases over time among all of these age groups. That must have been my minute. Um, particularly among those uh, 21 years and older. As we look at monthly marijuana-related emergency department visits from Essence, this is from March 2015, so we don't have a long time frame here because that's when all of the EDs started reporting to our system. We have seen a gradual increase over time, over this time period. Um, however, as multiple people have pointed out, actually, um, this is kind of any mention of marijuana in the chief complaint field or the discharge diagnosis, and not necessarily the cause that they came in, so it's any mention, so that's important to keep in mind. 
And then we have quarterly marijuana-related hospitalizations from 2010 to 2016, and have again seen this gradual increase over time. And the very last slide, which is encouraging, because uh, it was one of the main messages uh, for voter support of Measure 91, um, was arrest rates. And so quarterly marijuana arrest rates among adults from 2007 to 2015 have decreased over time with particular decreases after criminal penalty reductions in July of 2013, Measure 91 passing, and when possession was legalized. I don't have the slide here, but we also need to keep in mind that disparities uh, still exist. I don't have the slide, but when it's broken out by race and ethnicity, although all have decreased, uh, the arrest rate for black or African American folks is still double that of whites. So. I'm done. Adam. <laughs> thanks, every, thanks, everybody. Um, my name is Adam Lawrence. Uh, I am uh, with a firm called the Marijuana Policy Group. Um, and uh, we are economists uh, by trade. Uh, I'm here to talk mainly about uh, market characteristics, economic impacts. Um, we formed this company uh, in 2014, myself and my partner, um, when we were hired by the state of Colorado Marijuana Enforcement Division to do the first market size and demand study. Um, and we felt it was a, a compelling enough reason and we, we looked to the future and saw that this could really be an issue where we're gonna need a lot more uh, uh, economic study done on market sizing, on licensing systems, demand estimation. Um, because if you're gonna regulate and tax this product, you need to know your, the size of the market, you need to know about pricing, um, you need to know, because uh, you, you will have as a government regulator a point in time when you can make these rules in advance. Uh, and so being as informed as possible at that point uh, on, on um, uh, market size, on uh, how your regulations might affect tax revenues that come in wa was why we started this company. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, prevalence, which you heard a little bit of, of, uh, about before, uh, some of the elements of supply here. Um, demand characteristics, uh, some preliminary results on product mix. Um, uh, the city of Denver has asked if I address a bit on tourism and real estate impacts, so I have a couple slides on those. And then what, I, what I'm mainly here to talk about is part of a, a study we just released yesterday on the first economic impact study that has been done in this industry. Uh, so we're really excited about being to share that with an audience today. Um, here's prevalence. I, I won't go into it since you've heard some of it before, but an outcome of making a product uh, more easily to obtain, uh, the perception of greater safety, regularization, and, and it is safer uh, and more regulated than in the black market, you have increased prevalence. Uh, this comes from the National Survey of Drug Use and Health, where p government people call you on the phone and ask you about your drug use. So it's plagued with underreporting. Uh, and we've seen here between the gray bars, uh, the period between when we voted on legalization here in Colorado, and this is Colorado past month and past year use, and when it was commercially opened. Uh, and so uh, data wobbles aside, I think it might be uh, that people are becoming more open about admitting that they are a cannabis consumer is in here. Also, there is prevalence going up of more people using it. And uh, I, I also would think that in that increase too is some in-migration of cannabis enthusiasts that think this might be a great place to live. Um, so when we estimate demand, which is our first step in uh, estimating tax revenues, estimating license allocations, things like that, um, it's important to not just look at some of the top level estimates of uh, prevalence percentages, but to delve a little deeper, which is right here, and looking at prevalence by days of use. Um, this is a distribution for Colorado. Um, most of them in any state look like this, although we feel here in Colorado, uh, some of the other states like Oregon and Washington, who are the early legalizers, have a, a disproportionate amount or higher amount of 
of those heavy users, which is uh, this, this bar right here. Um, what that means, though, is when, when you apply a, a, a quantity used, this 188, which is maybe about 20% of the population, is responsible for demanding 70 plus percent of the product. These are the folks that are coming to the stores more often. They're also more likely to have medical marijuana cards and, and be medical marijuana uh, uh, patients. Um, and what you see here, if you look at the, the bar on the right, is for 2015, this is for 2014. Here's our total demand amounts um, that we have just about 70% is in those daily users or near daily users. Um, and you're seeing less demanded in terms of quantity by your uh, um, occasional users. We don't even look at those who have uh, used marijuana uh, outside of the past month uh, because they're really responsible for like less than a half a percent of the market. Um, so uh, what we're also seeing here is some shifting. I think Stephen uh, and Catherine had alluded to it that you know there are more that heavy user population is growing. Um, some of the occasional users uh, we also see growing. Um, and then what you notice here too is in terms of the tourists that we think about that would be coming to Colorado to go skiing, that would be coming to Colorado to go see Pikes Peak or what have you, and then would consume cannabis on the side, um, which is how we like to think of tourists when we were doing our studies. Um, they really aren't responsible. While they're here a lot in numbers and you hear a lot about it in the press, um, you know, we feel that these tourists that come for a Colorado purpose and patronize the stores, um, they're not here long enough. They, they face uh, uh, an illegal action if they bring it out of the state. And so we don't feel they're very responsible for a lot of the quantity that is consumed here. Um, so talking about tourists again, this is a survey done by uh, the Denver uh, Tourism Bureau, the Colorado, Colorado Tourism Bureau. Um, it was a survey where uh, we asked tourists if uh, legal marijuana had uh, increased or decreased their likelihood to visit. Um, and you know, when I look at this, I, you kind of see that it's equal amounts of people are, or almost equal amounts are turned on or put off by the fact that we legalize marijuana here. Uh, and most of them, it, it doesn't really matter in, the, uh, in that tourism survey. Um, another thing that we look at, these are our estimates, these are not official state estimates, is you know, when we estimate demand, we then, on the other side, on the supply side, we've been trying to tabulate where they come from. Um, and what we're seeing here when, when we look at, because in Colorado, you don't just have the regulated market, like we like to call it the retail and medical marijuana uh, centers and stores. Uh, we also have the caregiver system, which is a remnant of our medical marijuana amendment, uh, which was passed in 2000 or 99, I believe. Um, where a, care, a, a caregiver gets licensed by the Department of Public Health and Environment. They can have uh, patients that they directly grow and provide for, and they're not regulated in the same way that commercial marijuana production is regulated. So um, we feel that the regulated market was at about 60% of demand uh, last year, and, and we, we find it growing uh, over 70%. Um, you know, in these numbers are a couple different complicating factors, right? There are uh, people that may be coming here uh, to purchase some marijuana and then leaving the state to bring it and sell it somewhere else. Um, there are those that live in Colorado that may still have a black market dealer. Uh, and so there are many ways that um, we see there are compounding factors, but these are our best estimates right now that we feel like the, the prices are coming down enough in the regulated market there that it is becoming just like you wouldn't uh, brew your own or, or distill your own hard alcohol. It's much easier to buy it at a store. That kind of thinking and that kind of phenomenon is happening more and more as the prices have come down here. We're seeing last year average price per gram uh, in the retail market, about $8, it's going lower, um, and medical is probably around five bucks a gram. Um, 
I'm going to talk a bit about product mix. Um, this is something that uh, I'm not sure if governments that are considering, uh, you know, have a ballot measure, uh, are thinking about how the different product types and the production practices that go into them affect the footprint of cultivation around a community. Um, concentrates, edibles, uh, are, are produced mainly using the trim of the plant. Uh, and as these get more popular, which they are, um, you're gonna see differences in uh, the amount of cultivation space that's uh, leased up, the amount, because they have different production functions and different production uh, uh, tr uh, uh, paths to get to the market. But this is for medical marijuana. Um, we see still very strong flour, and, and in fact, flour is uh, a larger part of the market. This is by sales than in recreational, um, but it is declining in both markets. Um, we see concentrates. These are uh, what uh, Stephen was referring to as dabs. This is marijuana extract, uh, extracted using solvents such as carbon dioxide and butane. Uh, produces a concentrated uh, marijuana resin or oil uh, and it is uh, consumed with a vaporizer or uh, it is uh, smoked. Um, so we see that as a, a small still, but very much rising part of the market. Edibles, not as popular in medical. And this last category, these are the categories of the Marijuana Enforcement Division. Infused non-edible includes topical applications, lotions, salves, things like that. I'll, f I'll flip it quickly to recreational and you'll see that edibles are gonna be jumping higher and concentrates while still are still popular and still growing. Um, edibles are a larger portion of a recreational marijuana market. Um, they're more popular with casual users. Um, they are someone who, you know, would say, I haven't tried this stuff since the 60s. They would go for a cookie first, probably before smoking it out of a pipe uh, or, or, or smoking a joint. So we see that a lot um, with tourists and with uh, those that are very casual users. Those edibles are more popular. Um, start to talk about our economic impact study. Um, something we're very excited about. Um, this industry has only been able to, to be described using the sales amount at the register or some of the demand numbers like we showed you before. But you were never really able to understand what really happened when a new industry uh, uh, grows here and then also is interacting with the existing economy. So for the first time we were able to, because of our access and our clients that are both private and public sector, we have a unique viewpoint where we understand what it's like to run a marijuana growing or retail operation, but we also understand from the, the kind of 30,000 foot market view, we were able to construct um, these production functions for three new sectors in the economy for marijuana cultivation, extraction, uh, and retail. Um, we we, uh, we tapped some of, some of the larger uh, uh, industry participants in Colorado and elsewhere, um, and we were able to construct these three sectors and graph them into the economy. So economists, when they look at an economic impact, you don't just look at the total of the sales at the cash register, but these marijuana businesses are hiring people. Those people are uh, also living in the community, spending money on groceries. We call that an induced impact. And then also those businesses have to buy supplies. They have to buy packaging. They, ha they purchase security services. They have lawyers. They have accountants. Um, they are participants in the economy. And so this is the first time this more holistic picture of economic impacts has been able to uh, be brought into discussion. Um, so this is a graphic that just shows, you know, you, when you create a direct job, you also create jobs in support industries. Like this, you know, these support jobs, these indirect jobs are, uh, you know, at grocery stores, at restaurants, at wherever everybody spends their money at. That's how we've been able to graph this in. Um, these were some of the production uh, functions and, and spending profiles that we were able to build for each of these sectors. Um, 
you'll see that for infused product manufacturers and retailers, some of their largest expenditures are the marijuana product itself that comes from the cultivators. We also have high employment uh, cre uh, compared to other kinds of manufacturing and retail industries. Uh, and some of this is because of uh, the compliance load that's on them and uh, um, the unique uh, facets of the industry where, where they have to have special types of security guards that are licensed and badged and special types of retailers. Um, I think one of the most important findings that we found is because of the regulatory structure uh, that the state imposes on this industry and every state imposes on this industry and the fact that it's federally illegal, there is no interstate commerce allowed in this industry. So all, the entire supply chain has to exist within Colorado. And so you see these multiplier effects to be high in this industry compared to others. Uh, when you buy just a, a normal product, you know, your thermos you have right there, you know, that thing uh, I bet was not made near where you bought it, uh, nor did it employ people locally that, uh, or was it, where was it? <laughs> yes, right, so we're not importing cannabis from China, we, you, nor can we import it from California or from Arizona or Nevada for that matter. So, so these multiplier effects end up being quite high. Um, last year we had a, bi a billion dollars of sales at the cash register, but what that really meant was wh when you include all the ancillary industries, it's about uh, 2.4 billion dollars of economic activity uh, in total. And along with that comes about 12,600 direct jobs, full-time equivalents. Um, this is different than the number of occupational badges that's uh, issued by the state. Uh, that's, that number is probably about 27,000. Um, it is less than that because there's a lot of part-time employment. Um, but we see the industry supporting over 18,000 jobs uh, here in Colorado. And uh, I, I would say that this is the first credible number uh, that uh, where we can start to talk about the employment. Um, and our model can be, while it was built specifically for Colorado, um, we can adapt it to other geographies, states, counties, uh, and the like. Um, and I have one last thing to talk about. It's my minute is up too. Uh, um, but uh, a lot was said here uh, about the real estate impacts. Um, and uh, um, there was a study done, this was a study done by a local commercial brokerage. Um, you know, the footprint of cannabis, uh, because here in Colorado, most cannabis is still grown indoors. Uh, it is grown in specific districts. I know some of you that took a tour visited, visited uh, that, uh, probably one of those districts yesterday. Um, but in terms of a footprint, it is quite small. But the stories that came about commercial real estate here, um, were that at a period when commercial real estate was really soft here, uh, probably about 2009 to 2014 was when we had uh, still the lingering uh, uh, effects of the recession. One of the last things to recover is uh, industrial space and demand for industrial and office space. And this industry was leasing up industrial space, uh, often in areas that uh, where you know it'd be the last square foot that would be rented. Um, you know, these cultivators would be going in there and, and renting them. And so, you know, the, the word around here was just because of the timing um, that the industry did a lot to bring industrial real estate back uh, to, um, to uh, a leased situation when there was a lot of vacancy. So I'll leave it there um, with some summary uh, graphics. Thanks. Here. All right, and then we're gonna wrap it up real quick with a couple of um, topics, crime, the environment, and operational impacts. So in terms of crime, um, marijuana-related crime represented a small portion of overall crime in Denver before legalization. That's still true today. It really hasn't fluctuated that much. It's about 2% of overall crime in Denver. Um, when you look at this graph, I do wanna point out, it looks like it went from about 48,000 crimes to 60,000 crimes in 2014. That is not true, um, it's just we started reporting crime in a different way, and so when you normalize the data, it's pretty much flatlined um, between the years. 
What we are seeing is that what we're ticketing is changing. So in 2012, we were issuing primarily possession tickets. Today, we're issuing primarily public consumption tickets. Um, and one of my pet peeves is that people like to say, oh, well, public consumption has increased by 1,000% since legalization. That's not the case. What happened is there wasn't such a thing as a public consumption ticket before 2012. So when you go from something that doesn't exist to something that exists, yes, it, it appears to be a massive increase. Um, but the overall quantity of tickets being issued has remained relatively stable before and after legalization. Um, something we've seen that's surprising is that the amount of illegally seized marijuana has been on the rise since legalization. We attribute this to the you can now hide in plain sight fact. Um, if I opened up a warehouse tomorrow and put a thousand plants in there, my neighbors would think I was a licensed business even if I wasn't. Um, and so because of this, we see this upward trend in how much illegal marijuana there is in the city. We do expect that if legalization spreads across the country, this will go back down because the financial benefits to be gained of this game they're playing will fade away. In terms of DOIDs, we have seen a doubling in DOID citations related to marijuana from 33 in 2013 to 73 in 2015. Um, now, this is a really bad picture of what's probably happening in the streets because the science behind these tickets is iffy. It requires a drug recognition officer to come out and do a field sobriety test on you and then a blood test on you. Um, and Denver has a very small force of DRE officers. Not surprisingly, we doubled our force from 2013 to 2015. Maybe had something to do with the number of citations doubling. Um, we would expect that if we doubled our force again, we would see tickets go up as well again. Um, still on the books right now, DUIDs related to marijuana pale in comparison to the number of just straight alcohol-related DUID citations we we're handing out. Um, looking at crime data in terms of demographics, we have identified that the vast majority of people receiving marijuana citations are men, 83%. Um, almost half of those are men under the age of 21, and that's very troubling. Um, but it's also fabulous data for us to have because Denver has been able to justify spending millions of dollars on after-school programming and summer camps to keep at-risk youth off the streets and in more productive programming. Um, and those programs for the people who have gone through them have been highly successful. So to pivot on to the environment, um, people want to know is the industry really as green as you, know, you think? Um, the answer is that Growing marijuana is pretty much the most energy intensive industry out there. Um, it's comparable to running a data center. So from 2012 to 2014, the amount of electricity that um, marijuana cultivators were using doubled. By 2014, it accounted for 2% of Denver's total electricity usage, which is a lot for one small industry. Um, nearly half of the city's increase between 2013 and 2014 in electricity usage was because of the marijuana industry. So this is a significant impact. One slide I put in here just for fun um, was I took the electricity usage data and split it out by the players. 138 players use between zero and 50 megawatt hours of electricity each year. About half of the players use between 50 megawatt hours and a gigawatt of electricity each year. And less than 10% used a gigawatt or more of electricity each year. So the fun part is that the smallest 138 players in the market use less electricity combined than the one largest player in the market. So we definitely have some stratization in the marketplace in Denver. Um, Denver Wastewater has been monitoring loading, which is the introduction of unwanted chemicals, soils, pesticides into the sewage system. They have found no loading. Um, they're not concerned with this anymore, and that's really a good thing. Um, a slide that I didn't have time to put in because I got the data yesterday, but I'll tell you about, um, is that Denver Water has determined that the average marijuana cultivator uses as much water as a small coffee shop. So they are way, way, way below um, the water intensity usage than, like, let's say, a microbrewery. Um, so they're not really a water-heavy industry if they're growing indoors. I wanted to touch on some waste management data, so I reached out to All Pine Waste and Recycling, a full-service waste disposal company here in Denver. As far as I know, they are the only company that's currently composting for the marijuana industry. 
they did some research and found that 12% of um, their average customer waste is diverted to recycling and composting, whereas 18% of the average marijuana customer's waste is diverted to recycling or composting. So they are a little bit um, more likely to put more of their waste into responsible like disposal methods. Um, an implicit downside to the industry is that it smells really bad. Um, so in 2014, a health impact assessment was conducted for several of Denver's poorest and most industrialized neighborhoods. The finding was that odor was the number one quality of life complaint, leading to issues such as headaches, nausea, eye and throat irritation, um, a general reluctance to go outside to say, go for a jog or garden or have your friends over and socialize. Altogether, 90% of respondents said their lives would be better if odors were reduced. Now granted, this specific area of the city has more cultivators than any other part of the city. Marijuana was the fourth leading, bless you, cause of um, odor concerns in that area behind pet food manufacturing, meat packaging, and asphalt shingle manufacturing. Um, so the city's response to this was to adopt an ordinance this year that is going to require all marijuana grows, MIPS, and those other stinky industries to have and utilize odor control technology by the summer of 2017. Hopefully we'll have data to see if that worked soon. Now, to get a little bit into the operational impact of all this on the city, because it's been so much work, and I want to quantify that for you, um, I think we could all agree that at this moment, Denver is the epicenter of the legal marijuana market in the world. Uh, we are home to 1,091 active licenses operating out of 481 unique locations as of two days ago, three days ago. Um, that is 37% of the state's licenses, even though we're home to 12% of the state's population. So we have a ton of licenses here. The bulk of the industry is here. Now, over time, we really haven't seen the number of licenses and locations change much since recreational sales began. Um, so this is not really an indication that the market has hit some sort of an equilibrium where supply and demand are meeting. It's more of a factor that Denver City Council adopted some very stringent regulations on who could open up a new location or get a new license. And so you see this almost flatline effect um, happening. But that doesn't mean that we haven't been working because we haven't gotten, new, gotten any new applications. Um, to the contrary, we've been very busy. This is a overview of the Department of Excise and Licenses total workload, including new applications, renewal applications, inspections, and then amendment applications, which are people buying, selling, moving, or expanding an existing license. And what you see is that because people cannot come in and get a new license, which is this little green line, they are buying, selling, moving them to their liking. So we get about three times as many amendment applications as we do applications for new licenses. This is really the driver of our work right now. Um, when you want to amend a license, five agencies have to come out and inspect you. You might have to get a public hearing. You might have to do a neighborhood notification. You're always going to have to reconcile your old paperwork against the new paperwork. It's, it's a ton of work. Um, and to put a number on just how much work in 2015, over 8,000 inspections were conducted at marijuana facilities by City of Denver employees. Um, that's all of the agencies, so building, zoning, environmental quality, public health inspections, the fire department and licensing combined. Um, the vast majority of these are licensing inspections, so that's that if you want to move a license, buy a license, make a license bigger, um, you have those five inspections. Also, though, there are a lot of compliance inspections. So fire, for instance, says, OK, well, if you have an 80,000 gallon tank of butane on your premise, we probably want to come visit you once a year and make sure that it's not leaking. Um, so they come out twice a year, and other departments do compliance inspections as well. When we think about how long those inspections take, it's a long time. Um, it's anywhere between an hour to two and a half hours per inspection on average. So the minimum amount of time you're likely to um, expend in inspections 
to get a new license or modify a license is 8.75 hours. And that's saying no reinspections. The reinspection rate for some agencies is 85%. So this is best case scenario you're looking at to get a license eight and a half hours of city inspection inspector time plus anything that you had to do for a public hearing, a neighborhood notification, plus all the paperwork. So it is really labor intensive to manage this industry in Denver. Um, something that's very promising is that the industry is learning and becoming more and more compliant over time. So shout out to public health inspections for having incredible violations data. Um, over time, they found that the average number of violations they are documenting per inspection has dropped since the beginning of 2014 till now. Um, a graph I don't have here, uh, but I can tell you about, is that when you look at the average amount of time they spend at each inspection, it has been basically um, rising like inversely with this line. So that tells us the more time we spend with our industry, investing in their education, helping them understand what we expect, um, the more compliant they become and they want to learn and they want to be compliant and that is a really great thing we have going on with our industry here in Denver. How do we pay for all of this? Um, sales tax mostly. So we have a number of sales tax revenue sources. Um, we have a base sales tax on everything that's bought and sold in the city plus that special 3.5% tax the voters approved for recreational marijuana. Plus the state has a sales tax and they give us a share back of that. And then we have licensing fees. So all together in 2016, um, we expect to bring in just shy of $35 million in revenue. It's been increasing every year. Um, and of this revenue source, I think it's this bottom three. So the state share back, um, the special recreational sales tax and the licensing fees are all funneled into um, marijuana specific expenditures. So once a year, my office, the Office of Marijuana Policy and the Budget Office hang out and we say, what are the mayor's priorities um, for combating the negative impacts of marijuana? Last year, we, well this year, we spent about $9 million on four main priorities. $3.2 million went to regulation. $2.4 million went to enforcement. Two million went to education efforts, and about a million five went to public health. So altogether, the city is making a net gain of about twenty million dollars, more or less, um, from the revenue we're seeing. That goes to the general fund and gets, you know, used for things like rec centers and potholes or whatever needs to be done. Um, and that seems like a lot of money, and it is a lot of money. I mean, who wouldn't take twenty million dollars? But in the grand scheme of things, it's about 2% of the city's overall operating budget, so it is not making or breaking our bank by any means. And finally, um, I wanted to show you this dashboard we've put together. Uh, we've built it on an Oracle platform. You open it up in a regular browser, web browser, you log in, and this is really where all of our operational data lives. This dashboard taps into source databases. It updates every day. Um, and it really has given us this unique capability to report on data and operations that we never had before. So some of the things we have and some of the um, features of the dashboard that are similar between all, all graphs are that um, you can say, for example, for revenue, I want the first six months of revenue for the year. I only want to see it for 2014. I only want to see base sales tax. So you select your options or you don't. Um, you apply them and voila, your graphs come out the way you want them. You can export those graphs, you can pop them into a PowerPoint slide so you can see how much work I did to put this presentation together. There it is. Um, you can download a data detail of what is actually being shown in the graph. Um, so this could be anything for if you're showing like active licenses, I want their name, their location, their state license number, their expiration date. Um, in this example, it's just how much revenue did we bring in by month, by year, by source. We can split down any graph by any dimension, basically. So we track revenue, we track gross sales of total products sold in the city. Uh, we track crime, the page was down when I was making the video, but we track how many happened, where they happened, when they happened, how much illegal marijuana we seized. We track the number of applications we've received by type, how long they've been aging. We can tell you exactly where in the process each one of those applications are, if they're waiting for a hearing, if they're getting inspections, if they're waiting for a state license. Um, we track our amendment applications as they come in. So these are those transfers of location, modifications. 
um, those sorts of things. We track licensing data. So for example, if we want to prepare for peak season of renewals, well, we know when that is, so we can staff up. Um, we track overall workload, total number of active licenses, total number of licenses, period, whether they've been denied, expired, surrendered, what have you. How many inspections have been performed by each department, how we're doing in meeting our scheduled inspection goals. We track facility locations. We track um, ongoing court cases by type. We track how many permits we've issued, when we've issued them, how much revenue we brought in, how many are still active, what types they were. And finally, we track violations data so we can say this operator got six violations last year from these six agencies. Um, so hopefully it's pretty apparent that this is an amazing tool. We love it. Um, I want to give a special shout out to Wishes. Is Wishes here? Wishes, Wishes, can you stand up? Who has spent the last two years of his life building this, so thank you, Wishes. And with that, we are going to open it up for questions. So thank you so much. If you want to, do you want to jump up to a mic or do you want to just shout? Why don't you jump up to a mic? Yeah. Uh, Cody Stifler here from Biotrack THC. I just wanted to say first, thank you guys for your participation and all the information. It's been very informative. Uh, we appreciate everything that the city of Denver and Colorado in general has been doing for the industry. Uh, my question is, with a lot of the trends that you're seeing in the increase in emergency room visits, DUIs, uh, citations for public consumption, is there any relation to the trend in increase in population for Colorado since legalization? Is there some of that that's, that's taking away from the impact? So I can answer that in terms of the emergency department visits and hospitalizations. We actually, in the way that we calculate the rate, are able to smooth for population effects. Um, so just that that's a concern of ours too, of course, uh, the uh, traditional way to calculate rates of health effects is to compare it to a population, you know, an estimated population like the census. And we've, since the census, it was in 2010, we stopped doing that. And so we look at uh, emergency department visits associated with marijuana divided by the total number of visits in a year. So we do, a, we do smooth for that. Do you want to jump up to a mic, or do you want to? Yeah, that might be easier so we got, can hear you. Oh, do you want to go first? Sure. So with regard to economic impacts, I haven't seen any studies that relate to this, and I just wanted to ask the panel. We know that ER visits have increased, and the poison control center call, calls have increased, and the most recent Rocky Mountain high impact uh, density trafficking area, trafficking area report reported on the traffic fatalities related to marijuana and DUID arrests. Have there been any studies related to the economic impacts on auto insurance and health insurance rates for the general public? So the, <clears throat> we did not examine those in our study. This it was beyond the scope. We focused in on jobs and uh, multiplier effects. Um, but I do not know of any uh, uh, study done on auto insurance specifically. Um, I, I would say that uh, it will be interesting and we need more time to tell exactly how much of this growth is affecting those types of measures. I think in all of our data that was presented up here, there should be a caveat of, we're about two and a half, oh, two and three quarters years in here. Um, and I think really the true impacts, positive, negative, whatever they are, um, there is still a degree of we don't know yet, but we are still looking forward and trying to find all okay. this stuff out. Thank you. Um, and to that effect, I just want to add, I think part of the question is we still don't know how marijuana usage really applies to, for example, how does it impact your health? I mean, I've gone to a couple of medical conferences and they said, well, we don't think it gives you cancer and it actually improves your lung quality, you know, after you smoke it for this period of time. And so until they figure out, does it impact? I've seen studies that say it makes you get into more accidents. I've seen studies from, you know, reputable sources that say it has no impact on traffic accidents. So in terms of kind of tying it to health insurance and traffic, um, well, health insurance and auto insurance, I think they'd first have to figure out does it actually have a negative impact, and if so, to what extent? Okay. 
And one last thing on that too. I, I think it's going to be incredibly difficult to really prove causation in any of these things, right? There's how many variables go into traffic accidents, right? How much did it snow that year? How many, you know, there's, there's going to be these kind of pieces of information that are going to be seemingly correlated or related and they'll go up and down, but man, it's going to be hard to really say definitively, yes, this really affected this or this made this better and that worse over there. So that's, that's kind of how we're, we're starting to look at it. And I know the state has instituted a data tracking program that I look forward to seeing what happens in the next few years and how well, that and, matures. And with all due respect to the panel, there is causal effect between alcohol and marijuana use and increased DUI and DUID arrests and traffic accidents and fatalities. I, I have to dispute that that would be in question. I'm, and, and it doesn't require a drug recognition expert to make a DUID arrest, any patrol officer can do that. So I do have to dispute that there is not causal evidence that marijuana increases DUID arrests, accidents, and fatalities. I mean, I think the, it's unfortunate that there are just competing studies at this moment. So studies have definitely come out saying, yes, it does have a causal effect. Studies have definitely come out saying it does not. So for us as a neutral party, as the government, um, we don't really get to pick and choose. We kind of wait for a consensus to come out. And then we say, this is the consensus. But until um, you know, the researchers come to a consensus, it's hard for us to to, to stand behind any one study over another. And I think yeah. I'm just talking more about the c criminal justice system yeah. and convictions, yeah. and that would just be evidentiary based. Okay. I guess my question kind of stems off of that also. You mentioned something about DUID citations and the lack of DREs that are available. Do you have any data about DUID actual convictions from that citation, <laughs> any kind of rate? Um, I do have the data. I don't have it prepared. But yes, we do have data to that effect. Have you noticed that there is a difference in conviction rate between DUID, especially marijuana, and DUI alcohol? Anecdotally, I have heard that when marijuana-related crimes go to jury, it's hard to get a conviction. Um, I don't think that we've seen data on that, but I think that you know there is this it, it's just hard to get, it's harder um, to get a marijuana conviction than we might think across the board. That's what, what I've heard, but I, ha I don't have hard numbers um, to speak to that. Well, does that concern you? Because without a conviction, yes. you have a higher rate of recidivism. <laughs> yes, yes, it's definitely, yeah, it's something we're definitely concerned about and we're keeping a close eye on, yeah. Hi there, uh, very much enjoyed the talk and thank you for the excellent data. Um, my question is really about the economic impact study and where you can draw the lines on that and what is included and what's not. And in particular, I work in asset and loan sales and originations in the cannabis industry. And I was just meeting with a lender yesterday and they have nearly a $20 million loan portfolio and many of these businesses have their own balance sheets with large scale real estate assets. And you know, we see a lot of transactions. And so um, I guess my question is, you know, how are things like real estate sales, um, you know, are you tracking financing in the industry? Are you tracking, you know, these asset sales? Are those figuring into the impact? Because these are, you know, these are cases that I believe are widespread and some pretty big ticket, um, pretty big ticket categories. That's a great question, because uh, what you're describing is kind of on the bounds and the margins of what's included and what's not, right? The real estate purchases uh, that were made over the past year and, and that supports that billion dollars of sales is included in this and the jobs that that creates. But, you know, if someone shows up here tomorrow with a big bundle of money and says, I want to buy this piece of land over here. And, uh, you know, maybe on half of it, we're going to have a little grow. On the other half of it, we're going to have a dairy farm. You know, we're going to miss some things like that. But, you know, what I will tell you is it, it definitely includes very well the activity that is directly related and secondarily related to sales that are going on here. I can tell you that it is somewhat conservative in its projections because 
We have, uh, being kind of the first mover in this here in Denver, there are uh, entrepreneurs and others moving here that are, uh, you know, primarily in kind of the technological and tech piece of this that are looking at a national and international market for their products. And they are here in Denver employing a handful of people here and there. Um, but they're not, they're, their livelihoods and their sales are not directly related to what is crossing the cash register in, here in Denver. So we do not include those, and we could be considered somewhat uh, conservative in that manner. That's a good number. <laughs> Thanks. Hi there, uh, Victor from Portland, Oregon. Um, first, I want to thank you for your, um, you know, sharing your time, experience, and um, your knowledge on this subject. Uh, I wanted to ask about um, impact statements with uh, pertaining to public health and also to economic impact across race and ethnicity is uh, one of my questions, if you could touch on that. And the other, um, anecdotally, so I, I now do regulatory work. I used to have, uh, I used to work in advocacy and uh, community engagement. So anecdotally, I keep hearing in the community, especially in the Latino community, which I used to work with a lot, um, that there is a lot of fear and a lack of resources, um, a culturally specific and in language resources for communities of color immigrant and refugee communities. Are you doing any targeted outreach in those communities? So those are the two questions. So health and, and economic impact and then targeted outreach to inform um, in language and culturally specific. Who wants to grab that, Kevin? Great questions. Um, we know that in Colorado and Denver specifically, so I'm going to speak for Denver and not for Colorado, which is what I was presenting on. We do know that there are uh, concentrations of dispensaries in certain communities and that those are, do tend to be the most minority and impoverished communities. Uh, so that is an, an issue of concern for us. Um, for me specifically, I'm concerned that some communities are being sort of targeted um, as being susceptible. Uh, so that's a, an important thing for us and it's something where we do need to do more work to do targeted specific prevention education. I know there's, um, I'm not especially involved in the prevention aspect. Um, the health promotion work is done by other people, but I know um, that that's work that is being done in Colorado. There are a number of campaigns, um, but that's an important thing for us to keep in yeah. mind is the, you know, prevention activities that are specifically targeted to minorities. In, in the campaign, the state campaign is bilingual, so they do have all their materials in Spanish and English. <clears throat> and since you're from Portland, you may already know some of the Oregon context, uh, but in our Oregon Healthy Teens data, student wellness survey data, uh, we do see that the prevalence of current use is higher among black or African American folks, uh, um, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander, American Indian Alaska Native, uh, and having that surveillance data was really helpful and key in the development of the youth marijuana prevention campaign that's being piloted right now. Uh, based on those data, they conducted targeted focus groups um, with youth in those communities to test the messages that were approved by the Public Health Division as um, science-based. Uh, and then based on that, developed the creative, and they actually went for an approach of creating targeted materials to those groups first, um, and then hoping that it would also <clears throat> resonate with, <clears throat> sorry, resonate with the rest of youth as well. Uh, in addition, they conducted Spanish language focus groups as well, both youth and parents of youth. Uh, and interestingly, they found that uh, those folks preferred the youth uh, campaign to be in English, preferred to absorb it in English. Uh, but then they also developed a complimentary uh, parent guide on how to talk to their kids about marijuana and delaying use of marijuana and found that that uh, was helpful in Spanish. So that that was developed both in English and Spanish. And I think that just came out. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answered your question. But right now that campaign is being piloted in the Portland metro area, so kind of our dense urban area of Oregon, as well as Jackson and Josephine counties, which are a little bit more rural. And it's going through a pretty rigorous evaluation right now with a report due to, due to the legislature by the end of the year. And then they get to decide if the campaign rolls out statewide.
No, um, we looked at our economic impact study from the cash register only. A question for the gentleman from Oregon. Here in Colorado, our um, average potencies of flower and bud is about 17% and concentrates at about 62. Question number one is, are those comparable numbers to Oregon? And um, question number two is, given that all of the, most of the health studies that have been done here in Colorado are on two to 8% potencies when it comes to health impacts, how are you handling the, the disparity um, when it comes to youth messaging that the messaging is done around studies that are at a lower potency of, of marijuana? Um, so because we're in our, well, most of the data we looked at, we were in that early sales period through the dispensaries, and we actually, the Oregon Liquor Control Commission didn't start licensing actual retailers until this very month. And so they're getting their seed to sale tracking system kind of kind of going through going, growing pains right now, so we don't have those data yet for Oregon, so we really can't speak to those market characteristics. Uh, Julie is over here, and I'm not sure if you know Washington's. Yeah. Yeah, so sorry, a little early in Oregon to be able to say what the average potency is to compare to Colorado. And then I have written down two to 8% potency for your second question, but don't actually remember what it was. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, to the back. Some great data on the, uh, the economic impacts here. What about the economic impact on, uh, on law enforcement, specifically here in Denver? You talked about a $2.4 million uh, of revenue was uh, spent towards uh, enforcement, I believe, which equates to about 18 officers, not including equipment there. So not a big uh, mm -hmm. impact when it comes to resources, but what are you seeing as far as the impact on policing? And the second part to that question, you also talk about a 2% increase in crime related to marijuana, I believe, is that? 2% of overall crime is marijuana related. Okay, and is that crime, like? confirmed criminal offense? Does that include social disorder and nuisance crime? Guy passed out so, on the side of the road? That includes um, everything criminal. So let's say I'm walking down the street and I see that you're smoking a joint. I punch you in the head and take your joint and run away. That would be marijuana-related crime. Okay. Because I did it because you had the joint. <laughs> the obvious, but then the, the other the purest social. form of marijuana crime, I think, right yeah. there. <laughs> so, um, so to your question, are you asking what the cost to law enforcement has been? Is that the? Yes, okay. the economic impact on policing. So um, Denver has a force of, I think, 11 full-time police officers, including um, a lieutenant, two sergeants, and then an entire two teams, two marijuana teams of regular officers, detectives. Um, now, that's what we've allocated to the police department. Um, if we gave them another 20 people, they could go out all day long and find more crime. Um, so really, you know, I, th I think that it's, um, it's, it's more of, you know, it's a hard one. It's just we think we found the right fit and how many we need um, because our goal is to maintain the quality of life and we think we're doing that at the level of policing that we have dedicated to um, that force, and is that 11 people? It's 11 people. And then we also have a very robust city attorney team to back um, that DPD team up, because I mean, without an attorney to go with your police, you have no policeman, right? Um, so we've also invested heavily into hiring an entire marijuana unit in our city attorney's office to handle the cases the police are putting forward. <coughs> Does that answer your question at all? No. 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 And that um, was more like a robbery, not an assault, by the way. You're what? <laughs> that was a robbery, not an assault you described. Oh, sorry. But um, if afterwards, come see me, and I know somebody that could probably answer that question for you better. So. Singram, you'd mentioned that um, odor complaints were one of the biggest uh, issues that had come up. Yeah. And in response, the city came up with a new odor ordinance. Yes. 
Um, are you seeing other complaints where there may be a response like that? Like you had mentioned waste and you had mentioned energy consumption. Are you seeing a need to create amendments to existing ordinances or new ordinances to address some of these other issues that are coming up? So as far as I know, we don't get a lot of complaints. Um, the biggest complaint that we got other than odor was there's too much weed in the city. There's too many stores, there's too many grows, there's too much. Um, and that was really where the capping bill came out of, is we were responding to um, our citizens um, coming to us and saying, we've had enough, we want you to stop this. And that's what we did. Um, other than the capping bill, which really was a colossal um, effort to get through council and now implement, um, odor was the next thing up. I think the next thing we're gonna tackle is public consumption, honestly. We have a social use camp uh, initiative on the ballot that may or may not pass, and in the event it doesn't pass, um, we're definitely keeping an eye on that. And the other one is home grows, um, because we get a lot of, that's you know probably the other big complaint we get is somebody's growing pot in their backyard and their neighbor wants their kid not to hop the fence and steal their pot. So we get those complaints and we're definitely taking a very close look at that next as well. Okay, and that is time, so thank you all for coming.